Okay, our next uh, case is the Hashimoto case. You'll see that in your materials. It's listed under the area of joint and several tortfeasors. And by that language, what we're talking about is, is the situation where more than one person uh, is held as a defendant and is being held re accountable, responsible, liable for an in injury to the plaintiff. Uh, now, in this particular case, it, this is a, uh, a 1988 case. It's not a very old case. It's from uh, Wyoming, Supreme Court of Wyoming. And um, in this situation, there were, unfortunately, there were two car accidents uh, resulting in injury to the, uh, the plaintiff. In the, uh, the first, in, in, in both cases, the plaintiff was parked in his car, or not parked, he, he, was at a, he was at a stoplight, he's getting ready to make a left turn, and in the first case, he was, he, he was rear-ended by the first defendant, and there was a, um, an injury to the plaintiff's neck. Uh, eight months later, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Hashimoto is getting ready to make an, another left turn, and uh, same thing happens. Another defendant uh, rear ends him, and, and this causes injury to Mr. Hashimoto's spine. So uh, the courts you know, observes the fact that Mr. Hashimoto filed suit for damages resulting from both collisions. In the first injury, Mr. Hashimoto was rear ended by uh, Dixon, and Dixon was driving a marathon vehicle. He was employed by Marathon, marathon and apparently at the time, uh, Dixon was drunk. He was under the influence of alcohol. And uh, neck injuries resulted from that collision. The second collision was a collision involving uh, Morgan. Morgan hit Mr. Hashimoto, and those were the, uh, that was the accident that caused injury to Mr. Hashimoto's spine. So the court says that uh, Hashimoto filed suit uh, by suing Dixon, Marathon, and Morgan, uh, claiming uh, for punitive damages against Marathon and Dixon. Marathon was awarded summary judgment on punitive damages. Now, punitive damages are punishing damages. Those are damages that are awarded to punish the wrongdoer above and beyond the, the uh, comp compensatory damages, the damages to comp compensate the, uh, the plaintiff. Excuse me. Um, in advance of trial, that means on a pretrial motion of some sort, uh, probably a motion for summary judgment, the court ruled that because of the second collision, Hashimoto had met the burden of proving to a reasonable certainty, there's that word again, reasonable, that his subsequent problems were caused by the first collision and not the second, to recover from the two remaining defendants, Dixon and Marathon. Uh, now you have a case uh, that, like other cases that we've talked about earlier, is outlined. And this particular case is uh, also outlined uh, with uh, different headings. The first heading is burden of proof when successive injuries occur. Now you know that this is going to be important if you're looking at this case, which you, this kind of case, uh, under the area of, uh, of um, torts uh, for joint and several tort feasors. So you're going to, you're going to, that's a very important heading to you. You have to pay particular attention to that because these cases will have different headings about different areas of the law, and different things that happen in the, in, the, uh, in the litigation that go on to other areas of law. They have nothing to do with why you're studying in this particular um, chapter of, of your case book. So keep that in mind when, you, when you're reading these cases. Uh, now we look at the, uh, the, the further into the decision, and the court says that the ultimate injuries were caused by the second collision, which is a distinctive intervening cause because the first injuries had stabilized. Okay? Consequently, it would be inappropriate to hold Marathon and Dixon liable for the entire, in, the entire damage when no correlation between the two accidents has been shown. So the plaintiff didn't meet the burden of, of showing that particular correlation. Essentially, Hashimoto did not prove that the second collision, which was the subsequent injury producing act, was a sequela, you know, sequence, of the first collision. Additionally, no foreseeability of the second accident was shown by Hashimoto and consequently, the first injuries were not the proximate cause of the second accident. The first injuries were not the proximate cause of the second accident. Now, I think you look at these, I think the court meant to say this, the second injury. Very often you'll see typographical errors in here, and it's not uncommon, and, and uh, you, you, you want to make common sense out of this stuff, um, and it's very important that you do so. Uh, proximate cause cannot be established by mere guess or conjecture but rather must be proved by evidence of probative force 
as based upon reasonable probabilities and which precludes the fact finder from having to make an arbitrary choice between unproved conclusions. And the court goes on to say that uh, Hashimoto has shown no reason for this court to abandon the general rule. Now, when you're reading the case, it of course is the general rule, get out your highlighter, get out your marker, make asterisks, you know, whatever. Make sure you, you, you identify, you catch this. That one injured by the negligence of another is entitled to recover the damages proximately caused by the act of the tortfeasor. And the burden of proof is upon the plaintiff to establish that the damages he seeks were proximately caused by the negligence of the defendant. Okay? That's what this case stands for. Now, this case goes on for several other pages. There's a, a further discussion about uh, reasonable certainty, and that's a different standard for a different area of the law. You have to read all of the cases because, you know, the court, you know, number one, you, the court has to, obviously, we're deciding these cases, has to decide the entirety of the case, but when you're sitting in your, in your law school classroom, don't let anything come as a surprise to you. Everything that's in these cases, you have to read. So there, there cannot be any surprise. The, 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 the court goes off to talk about uh, uh, charges to the jury, whether the, the judge in this case properly instructed the jury as to uh, uh, the standard of, of, of its fact-finding. All right, that may come up. Now, uh, that's not involved with the law of torts, but when you sit in your torts classroom, you better know that material. And uh, this is a, a good case to read in its entirety to give you a general overview about um, the, the area of negligence.